Um, I'm going to give some background on control flow integrity and on the internals of uh, Microsoft Control Flow Guard. And then we'll go on with uh, describing our attack, um, which the short name is BAIT. And then we'll evaluate uh, the impact of our attack. Modern software is uh, often, yeah, the colors. Uh, modern software is often victim of memory corruption attacks. And uh, the primary goal of an attacker is executing arbitrary code. Often, this is done by hijacking the control flow uh, by corrupting, for example, function pointers. And when the application uh, makes a call through the function pointer, it is going to execute the attacker's malicious code. Control flow integrity is a solution to this. And the idea is to statically determine at compile time uh, what the allowed targets for a call are, and then instrument the code and at runtime check that the actual target lies within, within this allowed set. And if, it, if it's not within the set, then we can uh, terminate the process and stop the attack. CFIs uh, can protect two kinds of edges on the control flow graph of the application. Uh, forward edges, so that's indirect calls and indirect jumps, and backwards edges, which are basically function returns. The set of valid targets uh, for uh, a call site is statically determined at compilation time. But unfortunately, in the general case, this is an undecidable problem. So we have to resort to some kind of over approximation of the target set. Uh, moreover, um, there are performance implications. Uh, so in the end, there are uh, various uh, grades of precision for CFI implementations. And they can go from coarse grain, where you, have, you just have one big uh, valid target set that uh, all call sites are checked against, to very fine-grained approaches where uh, every single call site has its own allowed target set. Now, we look at Microsoft Control, uh, Microsoft Control Flow Guard. Uh, this is a coarse grain mechanism. So it has a global valid target set. Um, and it is widely deployed. Microsoft introduced it in Windows 8.1, uh, which has since been installed in more than 500 million machines uh, worldwide. At compile time, uh, the compiler determines valid targets for the calls and builds a valid target table, uh, which is embedded inside of the executable or the library. And um, CFG also allows to mix uh, an executables and libraries that support or do not support CFG in the same process. When uh, the executable is run, that valid target table is uh, used to populate a bitmap uh, which is used for uh, fast checking during execution. And this bitmap, the unit of this bitmap is uh, two bits wide, and it represents CFI information about a 16-byte aligned range of memory. Uh, so I will be giving some example to clarify this. For example, um, let's say that a certain 16-byte uh, range in memory in the bitmap has uh, value one zero. This means that the only allowed target in that range is the first address, the first 16-byte uh, line address. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but it should be read on, uh, on font one. But. On, the, on the other hand, uh, if a um, certain memory range doesn't contain any valid target, uh, then it would be zero. And this is obviously the default. Mo most... Uh, Targets are aligned to 16 bytes, um, so they are, uh, they are represented like this, but some are not. And uh, there is a value, 1-1, one, one, which is used for those, uh, but when um, the bitmap unit is 1-1, one, one, the whole 16-byte range becomes valid. Uh, this is a practical limitation to keep the bitmap size small. And this is exactly uh, what we end up exploiting. This looks like a very small imprecision, but uh, it actually has uh, very profound implications. This is a, um, 
overview at runtime, uh, the code is instrumented by the compiler. Um, then, once that it's executed, uh, it calls into a system library, which actually does the uh, CFI checks. And if those pass, uh, then the, the call is executed. Our attack uh, mainly exploits three, weakness, three weaknesses in CFG. Uh, the first one is the imprecision around unaligned targets. So if a valid target is not aligned, that the whole 16-byte range around that target becomes valid. It has no backwards as CF CFI, so it doesn't protect return instructions, and the bitmap is process-wide. Now, to understand our attack, we have, which also gives the name to our attack, um, because we're exploiting epilogues, we have to, under, to recall how functions are made. Uh, they have three parts, a prologue, which sets up the stack, the body, which is the actual logic implemented by the programmer, and an epilogue, which uh, tears down the stack. Now, a compiler will usually lay out the functions one after the other in a binary. So if we have a valid unaligned target, uh, which points to the beginning of a function, and the whole 16-byte range around that unaligned target is valid because of the CFG imprecision, then we are able to hijack execution to the epilogue of the previous function. And an epilogue deallocates the stack, and this basically means that it increments the stack pointer uh, because the x86 stack grows towards lower memory. So, from those epilogues, we define what we call PR gadget. So a PR gadget is just um, a sequence of instructions that comes from an epilogue that is allowed by CFG and that increments the stack pointer by a certain amount of bytes um, before returning, and optionally, you can also increment it after returning, um, depending on there is a variant of the return instructions that, that allow for that. So this, for example, is a P80 gadget, which means it increments the stack pointer by 80 bytes before returning. Now, the way we use this is, um, so on the left, uh, we have the uh, layout of the stack on, um, after a call on x86. And let's imagine the attacker um, hijacks um, execution to a PR gadget. The return address is at, at the top of the stack, um, but the PR gadget will increment the stack pointer and make the stack pointer point to, uh, for example, one of the arguments. And we can assume that the attacker has pretty good control over at least some arguments. So now, when that PR gadget returns, it will interpret one of the attacker control arguments as a return address. And since CFG has no backwards edge protection, it will just jump to that, and it will completely bypass control flow guard. This is uh, our basic attack on 32-bit. On 64-bit, there are additional problems uh, because arguments are not passed on the stack uh, anymore, at least the first four are not passed on the stack. Plus, there is a, in the Microsoft calling convention, there is a RPA, which is a basically uninitialized uh, stack area um, to spill registers into. And since the RPA usually doesn't contain attacker control data, an attacker would need a PR gadget that increments the stack pointer by um, a big amount. And those are rarer than the ones that increment by a small amount. To solve this problem, we introduce another kind of gadget, which is an S gadget, and those come from prologues. And it's easy to find uh, allowed prologues because they are beginning of allowed function. Um, a, an S gadget um, just spills, just saves some argument registers to the stack. So now we can, and it ends with a um, jump instruction, a call instructions that can be hijacked by an attacker. So now we can use an S gadget to set up the stack, uh, put some control data in the RPA, and then use the hijack call at the end to launch a PR gadget and um, launch uh, our actual attack. Now, we will evaluate the impact. 
um, when I, I forgot to say, I'm sorry, um, once uh, our attack bypasses CFG, and once the CFG is bypassed, then the attacker can apply all the normal uh, code reuse techniques uh, that are common in uh, real world exploitation. We evaluated all uh, system libraries in uh, recent builds of Windows 10. And um, we did this uh, basically for PR gadgets. We just pattern matched them because uh, their structure is mostly fixed. Um, as gadget, we used symbolic execution um, to uh, find out their semantics. We found um, some pretty concerning results. On 32 bit, uh, there are PR gadgets in the C runtime library, which is loaded by basically any process on the system. And because the bitmap is process-wide, this means that basically any process on a 32-bit Windows system is exposed to our attack. On 64-bit, uh, we found PR gadgets on some pretty high-risk libraries, such as media codecs and script engines, uh, which are found, for example, in browsers, which are commonly exploited. Um, as for conclusions, um, CFG is a coarse-grained approach. Um, it is very well performing in practice, um, but it has very strong assumptions about target alignment, and to, those do not always hold. And there are enough cases where they don't hold and where PR gadgets are generated, uh, then we can exploit them. Our attack has a high impact because the gadgets are widespread and uh, found in high risk uh, scenarios, it allows to completely bypass CFG and then change some common code reuse techniques. And it is feasible in practice. And we demonstrated this uh, in the paper with an exploit against Microsoft Edge. We disclosed this to Microsoft. It will be mitigated in Redstone 4. Um, we do not have yet information on how exactly they're going to mitigate it. Uh, but it should be uh, released in one or two months. And we have permission, uh, to grant us up, as permission to uh, share this work. Uh, thank you, and I will take questions now. Do we have uh, any questions? OK, just to kick off the uh, discussion, I have a a quick question for you. Um, so for the uh, mitigation, uh, we know that uh, this yeah. attack kind of exploit, uh, exploit the uh, sort of a known uh, design trade-off of uh, the yeah. uh, 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 control flow guard, right? So uh, I, I know you probably don't have much details, but uh, uh, from your perspective, how this mitigation can uh, prevent or mitigate this line of, of attack without sacrificing too much uh, uh, on the performance side? Okay, so uh, the, um, probably the easiest way is just to align targets, and this uh, would require compile compiler modifications. Um, but this may be difficult in certain kernel cases. For example, we found that some unaligned targets came from handwritten assembly, so that would have to be fixed up by hand. And it might also impact certain optimizations. It may uh, impact code size and uh, cache optimizations. And the other way would be making uh, CFG more precise. But the bitmap approach, um, there are some limitations on how much virtual space it can take up. Uh, because, for example, make, with using a bit for every byte, that means one eighth of the uh, addressing space is taken up by CFI, which is obviously not acceptable. So the most uh, likely mitigation would be to improve the compiler and manually fix. Uh, all the handwritten cases. All right, uh, let's thank Andrea one more time.